this, this session is going to be, there's a lot of time in this session for questions and answers. And we're just going to set the scene by picking up a number of aspects that were raised this morning about how do you teach core in large and diverse classes. So this is a, an illustration and I'll come back to teaching in this kind of class um, in a moment. So we're going to uh, begin with some reports from the front line uh, and then talk a little bit, bit about content and structure, picking up some of the really interesting uh, case studies we've now got about how people are thinking of designing courses either over one year or two years using the economy. And then at the end I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, the core approach to teaching and learning. So this is the, the first case study. This is uh, Dan Ridby in Manchester. And uh, so what, what, what I did was just pick out places where I knew were teaching either for the first time or with, with some experience in really kind of wildly diverse uh, settings. So uh, this is um, University of Manchester, which has a huge, um, a huge intake. Uh, Dan is doing it for the first time this semester. He's teaching in two groups. He's got about 450 BA Economics and Social Science and about the same number of other degrees. So there are these two giant groups being taught in a lecture theatre that fits about 450 students. Um, in both groups, he's got this um, really extreme mixture. Some students have A-level economics and A-level maths. So those students have really, in the British system, gone a long way in both economics, because they only do three subjects in their final, for their final A-level. So they've spent a lot of time in their last two years at, at school on maths and economics. They're in the same classroom with students who've done neither. So this is the kind of challenging heterogeneity that, um, that many people are going to be facing. Uh, what um, Dan said when I said, okay, let's have some challenges, he said there's just a really, there's been a really steep learning curve starting in, uh, when the term began at the end of September, a, a steep learning curve for TAs. And that's going to be a theme in, uh, in the discussion. And uh, Risa raised this, this question earlier, and it's something that I'd really like us to kind of get our teeth into in the, in the, in the Q&A session. Uh, something that we found, and you may find it as well, if you have some students coming into your course who've done the equivalent of A-levels or a standard uh, high school course in economics, which has been very dominated by this, right? Very, very dominated by supply and demand. These students are kind of deeply disconcerted when they start course. They, they feel, oh, I put all this effort into learning economics, and how come we have this first lecture when there's no supply and demand curve? I know all about that. The other, uh, these other students who are sitting next to me haven't done any economics. They seem to be getting on just as well as me in this first lecture. Um, I should be in a much better position than them because I've done all this economics. And then the second lecture comes. No supply and demand curve. The third lecture comes. No supply and demand curve. So they're thinking, oh dear. Right? So this is the level of kind of, um, of discomfort of some of the students coming in who come in feeling uh, in, in, a, in a way a little bit superior to their peers who haven't studied economics before. Um, uh, Dan reports that Unit 4 with the game, introduction to game theory is very popular with students, even with the students who've done A level, because this is something that kind of puts everyone together. Everyone whatever they're thinking of as their career aspiration, everyone can see immediately that uh, thinking strategically is going to be really helpful. So Unit 4 is a kind of a surefire winner. Um, whatever the level, the maths ability, the economics background, go for Unit 4. And he also found the teaching guides really helpful. Uh, there are many resources on the core website, you, you, but you've got to go and find them and use them. They don't kind of come out and hit you on the head. So uh, do take his advice that the teaching guides uh, are useful. And as with everything else, they get better because of your feedback. So the first set of teaching guides were really pretty ordinary. 
and they've gradually improved because of the feedback of really existing teachers saying, we need this explained more, How, how's the best way of teaching this, could we switch this unit around to teach it in a different way? So you'll find that kind of stuff in the, uh, in the teaching guides. Um, in terms of assessment, uh, big classes face the same problems everywhere. You've got to have machine marked. You've got to have Moodle uh, exams or whichever way you do your model cho uh, choice. There is almost certainly going to be an element of that in these really giant classes. So this is the way that he's doing it. He does include in his, uh, in his class some written work as well to be assessed for the uh, summative assessment. Uh, Dan uses live polling in class, in other words, ask, uh, putting up multiple choice questions, students log on on their phone and submit their answers. Wakes them up, you see the body language change immediately, they kind of uh, jerk awake because whatever the question is, they kind of want to be involved in, um, in pitching their answer in with, with everyone else's. And he's thinking of, of introducing some of the doing economics projects so that there's some of this practical work being done in the smaller class groups of about 20 that he has when he does it again next year. So the, the implicit lesson there as well is don't try and do everything the first time you're, you're having a go, right? You can introduce new things, you can try out new things. You don't have to do all the, um, all the kind of uh, interactive elements the first time, especially if that's not something that you've spent much time doing before in a big classroom. This is uh, Robbie Mockery from Harriet Watt University in Scotland. Uh, he's got a really big challenge. He's got uh, 1,200 students spread around the world uh, in Edinburgh, Dubai, and in Malaysia. And he is responsible in delivering the 100-level uh, principles course to all of these students simultaneously. And you can also see that these students are um, operating in different time zones. So if you thought you had a challenge, then think of his challenge, and it was also the case that he was uh, tasked with giving this course just a few weeks before he was um, on air. So this is, uh, this is a very, um, uh, uh, quite an exciting experiment. He's got students not only all over the world, but in very, from very different backgrounds. So from different faculties, social sciences, maths, computer science, but also uh, infrastructure and society, these other kind of uh, broader um, uh, degree programs that are being offered. There's no maths prere prerequisite for any student taking this course. Uh, and as well, he has not just undergraduates, he has these other kind of, uh, for most of us, different sort of students. He's got these um, graduate apprentices who are full-time students, but on day release from employment. And he's got some postgraduate students who are, who are actuaries who are having to fulfill an economics requirement. Um, so all of this kind of mass around the world and with these different objectives are all in front of his, uh, his class. Um, he, the one thing, so in red, he said that when he did some classroom observation or some of his colleagues did of the people teaching the smaller groups, then it really highlighted the need for TA training. He said, we hadn't thought about that because we were using experienced teachers, but that came across very strongly that that wasn't a good enough prerequisite for being able to teach this material well the first time around. He's giving short e-assignments, um, um, MCQs and so on. Uh, to supplement the slides, just as Nikki was suggesting, he was adding two slides for each one that was in the course slide deck to kind of give a bit more explanation. And I, what I haven't put up here because he, he, hasn't, he hasn't yet committed to making them available, but he, he basically taught this course through podcasts. So he, has a, he was giving them daily podcasts for all these people all around the world to lead them through the material. And this is an amazing experiment. We haven't uh, had this taught through podcasts before. Uh, he was in a situation where he didn't have much alternative, and we're hoping to get some edited versions of those podcasts so that you may also want to try that as an experiment. Not every day and not for every topic, but maybe occasionally, just as a different uh, delivery method. This is the, uh, the next one. Uh, so the, um, the Google Maps marks the spot of this, uh, this scene of teaching diverse 
um, students. So who knows where we are out here? No, the, no this little spot? Reunion, yes, this is La Reunion. So this is, um, this is the classroom that you saw at the beginning. This is one of the giant amphitheaters that they have at the university. No. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they've all, all been taught, uh, at the rate they're teaching them, everyone in Reunion will have been exposed to core. So this is, um, this, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, there are 800,000 people in Reunion, and you have a look at this. So this is from uh, uh, Zulfikar from Reunion. This is the fourth year of using CORE. This is what I mean about population coverage. Every year, all right, they've already had four years. They have 1,500 in the large amphitheater, and then they have about another 500 in smaller classes. So they're teaching about 2,000 students a year in, um, in, uh, in Reunion. Uh, the language of instruction is French. Um, this is a department of France. So the curriculum went through the French curriculum approval procedure, very formal kind of procedure. Um, he now actually uses the online, there's an online interactive full version in French, but to begin with, they were really doing their own translation. So they were, they were fairly dedicated as very early adopters there. Um, they, he takes the decision to give the slides in advance. We can have a discussion about that. Some people think that's a really good idea. Some people think it's a bad idea. Um, the students are really encouraged to do the MCQs, and now they can do them online, which they couldn't uh, initially. Uh, what he gets with the smaller groups is he gets the students preparing resumes of the units. So this is a skill that basically every student needs. Every student, whatever job they end up with, they're going to have to condense a lot of material and produce a really punchy summary. So building that in as a skill that can be acquired through taking this course is uh, something else that, uh, that you might think about. Uh, his advice, take local examples. Don't make slides like this. Never make slides like this. <laughs> don't, don't put too much on the slide. Uh, encourage the students to read the e-book in advance. Now they've got the e-book. He's moving to encouraging them to read it in advance. He says, don't have as a goal to treat all concepts contained in a unit in the classroom. Just select a few to do in the classroom on those kind of beautiful, much emptier, well-motivated slides. He says, the lectures have to tell a story to captivate the audience. And you think of that mass of students in those open amphitheaters looking out at you know, what else they could be doing um, on a warm afternoon. It's a, it's a big challenge to keep the students engaged. Wendy and I and the rest of the core project in putting this uh, work together, um, we realized that one of the main things that we try to teach our students is the value of theory and models. And that's really hard. And for example, in America, my students at the University of Massachusetts think that um, theory is, is uh, what's the opposite of theory? Fact. Uh, and that meant that the theory is non-factual, and that was not a good thing. So I had a really uphill battle. I mean, these were not sophisticated students. Um, but I want to emphasize that if, if, if we don't teach them the value of abstraction and the value of models, we haven't taught them very much. Uh, so, uh, and we talk a lot about narrative and, and uh, problems, but let's think about how we teach models in a typical course. Uh, well, uh, by the way, uh, Irving Fisher included that, uh, it was a, it's a hydraulic model of a, essentially a general equilibrium system. It was a very clever device. Um, but the, basically the way we teach models in a standard course is we have a set of models which we think they should know about particular things. We teach them essentially seriatim. Uh, and if a student asks, what's the point of this? Um, we give either some um, not very interesting example that fits pretty well, like choosing between pizza and beer or something like that, or we say, uh, trust me, this will come in handy later. Um, and uh, later means uh, maybe at the end of the course, but that usually doesn't really work out, but maybe in the third or fourth year. Uh, and uh, so the, um, uh, it's, it's, it's seriously demotivating, and I, I mean, I think we really fail 
to excite students with what what, what a model can can do. Um, so um, our, our our basic idea is, and, and I think this has been mentioned a couple of times before, we start with a problem that we think is pretty interesting and worth explaining. Um, uh, here, the the data are the uh, um, uh, work hours uh, and how they relate to uh, per capita income over time. Uh, students are very interested in that. They want to talk about you know, why it is that people work so many hours in America compared to the Netherlands, and why did it change so radically in, the, in, the, in Germany, for example, over time. Um, so we start with the problem, and we talk about where does the data come from, how is it generated, and so on. And we talk about examples that you may have about how you spend your time, and so on. And then we think, well, how can we conceptualize that? Uh, and of course, we have the model, you know, we have the model ready to go. It's not that the students are going to discover the model. Uh, but they, they work on it. But one of the things that's very interesting pedagogically is if you've introduced a question like, why did the work hours decline so drastically in Germany and Netherlands and not so much in America over the past hundred years? And then you teach them a model of essentially labor supply, uh, the supply of labor hours you are, are really, it's very difficult to avoid the question, uh, well, how well does this model do in explaining those historical phenomena? Uh, and of course, it's part of the story, but it surely doesn't explain the difference between, say, Korea, South Korea, and America, uh, or Netherlands. It must be that there actually are some differences in preferences, so the model doesn't do everything. We have to think about cultural differences between the countries and so on. Um, and so, ideally, and I say, I mean, we wish we had succeeded in every unit in introducing a really exciting problem, a set of models, and then a good discussion of, well, how good is it? I don't think the latter part we do as well as we might. In this case, I think we do. There's a, I mean, we, when we start actually applying this to the, to, to the empirical questions, you see, well, um, the, uh, uh, if you're going to fit Korea and US, the indifference curves for Korea and US have to cross, which is, of course, an indication that they must have different preferences. Uh, so um, uh, that's our basic way that we teach uh, models. And I, I stress it because the fact that we say so much about problems and narrative may suggest that we're indifferent to whether or not they learn the models. That couldn't be uh, more different from the truth. That's the way that we do it. Uh, now, let's, let's talk about um, the course outline. I want to talk about some of, the, uh, some of the reasons why we do what we do. Um, as you know, we start with the capitalist revolution. That's big questions, it's engaging people, beginning to do some things about how you handle data, where's the data come from. Uh, then the um, second and third unit are about individuals interacting with nature or with a, some inert uh, circumstance instead of given prices. Or, uh, so this is just an individual acting by herself or himself, uh, where we talk about um, uh, uh, the adoption of the technology or work hours choice. Uh, then we move to people interacting in a situation where there are other people interacting. That's where we introduce game theory, strategy, and so on. Uh, and uh, Reza mentioned this uh, property and power. Uh, it's a very critical uh, part of the curriculum because that's where we talk about uh, the exercise of power, as, uh, as I said in, in my talk. It's also one of the most novel parts of the curriculum. Uh, if, you're gonna, if, if you think about where are your TAs, if they were trained in, the, in conventional courses, where are they going to have to actually do some learning and have trouble if they don't spend some time on it, that's a unit in which they're going to have uh, trouble. Because people don't really study bargaining problems in standard courses. Um, and you know, it's a very simple bargaining problem. But, uh, so that's just a heads up. Uh, it's really crucial, and, and as Reza has said, you can ask lots of interesting questions in the course of Angela and, 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 and Bruno, but only if you really get on top of the methods. Um, then there are basically a set of uh, um, uh, units on markets. Wendy said, we'll get to uh, uh, price-taking markets here in Unit 8. And it's interesting. Um, uh, it was, uh, I was very interested in what Wendy said about Blanchard uh, having rejected ISLM and aggregate supply aggregate demand. That's not where modern macro is. Well, guess where modern micro is? I just, uh, uh, if you look at Maskele, Winston and Green, which is the, the, the leading PhD level uh, uh, micro course, uh, I, I was curious about, well, where does perfectly competitive markets come in their book? 
Now, typically in undergrad books, it comes in, you know, the second chapter or third chapter or something like that. But mass play, when it's in green, don't bring up the perfectly competitive market until chapter eight, uh, which happens to be exactly the number of the chapter before, does it? Now, why do they do that? I happen to know why they did that. They did it because they wanted to study basic uh, questions about how human beings interact in market-like situations before they go to the abstraction of a supply curve and a demand curve. I think it made good sense for them, and I think it made good sense for us. Um, then, um, and finally, we have some questions about how markets work uh, and how they sometimes don't work. Uh, this chapter here is very influenced by Hayek and Coase, you would be surprised to know perhaps. And this is a, a, a fairly standard Pigou Marshall type uh, market failures discussion, although it's, it's quite, quite a bit more extensive because given the fact that we have incomplete contracts in virtually all the cases, we necessarily have things that aren't covered in the contract. Those are called externalities traditionally. So uh, market failures are the, uh, are the norm. Now, this, uh, let me give you some examples like the ones that Wendy did. Uh, this, this course has been taught. Uh, um, uh, uh, Anders, who's shown here, uh, taught it in Hanoi and also in um, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, um, at Colorado State University. Colorado State University is not an elite institution. You know that uh, because of two words there. One is Colorado and the other is state. Um, uh, American universities which have the word state in them mean pretty far down the food chain. And you can judge for yourself about what, what Colorado means in terms of intellectual elite. Um, but I, uh, by the way, I didn't come from there myself. Uh, so uh, this is Anders Fremstadt, and this is how he uh, is organizing it. You'll see. Uh, he just says, okay, I'm sorry, Sam and Wendy, we're going to use the words micro and macro. Uh, even though they're banned, we actually tax them very heavily. Anybody who uses those words gets fined, and so on. The, uh, this is how, how he plans to do it. Now, I've, I've, I thought this is striking because he's covering a whole lot. Uh, now, for him, it works. Uh, um, I don't think this would work at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where it's also been taught very successfully, but with a, quite a bit more limited... Um, kind of uh, scope. Um, the, uh, uh, he was, of course, when he was discussing this with his uh, uh, colleagues, asked, well, what about the basic concepts? At Colorado State, they have a list of things you have to learn if you're going to be in the intro course. People have a lot of freedom in what they teach, but there is a bunch of stuff that they have to be able to talk about. The stuff, uh, and here is the list of all the stuff that they have to know. It's an interesting list. Uh, I'm not sure why everything is on there, but if you're at Colorado State and you're teaching econ, that's what you, your students have to know that. Uh, the ones that are not in bold are things that are not covered or not covered well by core. So this is part of a memo that Andrew sent to his colleagues saying, this is what core does, and actually his memo was quite a bit more uh, complicated because it said, you know, where do we talk about all these things? Where are they in there? Uh, now, this may be useful in discussing things with your colleagues to get a memo like that and say, well, here are the things you're expecting to find. One of the problems is you won't find them in the usual place in core. For example, you'll find price taking perfectly competitive equilibrium in chapter eight instead of much earlier. Uh, and now, uh, and this is again from Anders, uh, this is a bunch of new stuff um, uh, that uh, basic concepts that, uh, that, that you wouldn't find in the standard list. Now, of course, uh, I think over time, a lot of these things are going to be in the list pretty soon. Uh, I think that the thing that they're doing at Colorado State University is remarkably ambitious. And um, Wendy and I, in discussing with other groups around the world, think that something quite a bit less ambitious would be more effective and be less... I don't know, less pressure on the teachers and the TAs and students. Uh, we're not sure which is the right way to go. I mean, Anders is an outstanding teacher. But here's a very different approach, which is to take a few of the units and use them for the first year course, maybe half of them, and then take the rest of them and have them either be parts of the second year courses or uh, the basis of the second year courses. So for example, uh, Reza, you're not going to like this because unit five doesn't get included in the first unit. But this is basically uh, what the first semester would be. It would be 12 or 13 or 11 weeks. Uh, uh, and that would be followed here by macroeconomics. 
Um, now notice here, the labor market, our very um, modern principal agent treatment of the labor market has to come before the macro because it is the basis of our analysis of unemployment. Uh, and um, then, and this here would then be the, the content of a year-long intro course. Uh, the second year, um, we started off with property and power uh, here, um, and these are this is these are other macro uh, uh, other 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 micro topics, and it ends up with some topical things. For example, environment and equality. Any of the capstones could be used here, but these are the ones that students typically are interested in. in. Uh, the, uh, this could be done as a calculus-based course, uh, or it could be done, again, without calculus. Uh, as you probably know, the good thing about the calculus option in core is it's not very obtrusive. It's not in boxes which terrify students. You can click on it if you don't want to, and I think a lot of students never click on it. And some of them click on it once and they don't never want to do it again. But other people, by the way, really want it. Uh, and they find it helpful. So, uh, but you can teach a calculus-based course here. Here, you know, an option would be to teach us a, this would be a second year, second semester macro course, probably making a lot of use of the data exercises that are available. And this would be another possible way that we could uh, uh, configure such a course. Um, now these are options that we should talk about because I, I, what I suspect is that uh, people will have different situations in which something like this might work or maybe uh, other things of the types that I mentioned before. Okay, approach to teaching and learning. Hopefully again uh, we're going to have a lot of discussion about this. Um, and I'm not going to spend too long on it. Uh, this is, I'm introducing you here to some resources um, with the encouragement to get online and uh, look, look at them for, for yourselves. If, depending on how the Q&A goes and whether people would find it useful for us to go to the website, we can look at some of these things live. So this is the virtual workshop from Bristol that took place in June. This is how the workshop here is going to look online. It'll be set up in the same way. Uh, this is the session I thought might interest some people based on the quick discussion we had about macro uh, this morning. So this is se section six, session six, the labor market and the aggregate economy. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of other uh, uh, sessions. There's one on capitalism and democracy, which talks about how to teach, how you might want to teach in the 22. There's one on institutions, which begins with the uh, unit five and the, uh, there's a very spirited discussion in this uh, workshop, workshop session with Stephen Wright from Birkbeck College stepping in to defend Bruno and to uh, <laughs> really take Bruno's side um, in, the, in the argument. So, you know, get in there and you can have your own tussle with Angela and Bruno. Um, David Hope here from King's is teaching a large and heter heterogeneous class there. Uh, what he was, was talking about in this session was bringing additional material into the lecture. Uh, and what he does, and he hadn't, he, this was his, he, he looks about 15, okay, he's really young. This is his first job as a lecturer. It was, and he was thrown in the deep end to teach this, to lecture to this really large class. So he was kind of terrified at the idea of doing some sort of interactive, getting the class to do, do something. I think he thought, you know, the shouting might break out or, or, you know, the noise would become uncontrollable, but it would just be a bad thing to do. But anyway, he decided to try. And the way that he did it was uh, in Unit 13, which is uh, the macro unit, which introduces consumption smoothing, uh, he, uh, 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 he, he put up these two very recent articles here, just headlines. So young people worst affected by debt crisis, say charities, and then here the Financial Conduct Authority boss warning that young people are building up pronounced debt. So that was kind of seeding the idea in the student's mind. Then what he did was, this was his really the scary moment, he, he told students to read this, so you can read it. Okay, so quickly turn to your neighbour and do, can, can uh, carry out this exercise. Okay, we haven't got five minutes, you've got two minutes to do it. If you haven't got a neighbor and you're feeling lonely, find one quickly. 
Okay, okay, let's um, call a halt. So, like, like him, uh, you know, I was kind of terrified at getting you to do something. Um, but apart from people who clearly need to have a sight test, um, uh, it, it seemed that you got the idea. Some people, you know, continue discussing it, which is, you know, you eventually pull them back into the, into, into the mainstream. Uh, and you'll get some very interesting answers to this question. Uh, his classroom was uh, 250. You can't get uh, half of that. You can't get 125 answers back. But you, you can very quickly get five or six groups because they've all got something to say. And you can uh, report back those, uh, you know, what, what the conclusions were to this question. And you can see that he's asked a very pointed question. I hope you noticed this. Is this an example of consumption smoothing? Is this likely to help stabilise the aggregate economy? So you have to come to a view, and that's why you, I could see that many of you are actually arguing the toss about this. Okay? So this is something that you can do however big your classroom, however anxious you are about getting students to do something. It's sometimes called think, pair, share. Uh, it, it definitely works. Uh, this is um, a, another session from the virtual workshop, um, uh, the session teaching institutions, and the person uh, talking about that is talking about it from the perspective of a TA, a graduate teaching assistant, this is a PhD student, talking about how, from his perspective, uh, you, can, you can get into the, uh, the teaching institutions in Unit 5 and the difficulties that students face or not. So this is uh, Gonzalo Paspado, he's a UCL TA. He wins, a, wins an award, this is another thing. You win awards if you innovate using um, some of the methods that, I'm, uh, uh, that we're, we're, we're suggesting and that have been suggested by many of you here. Um, interesting thing he says here, so he's saying, have an open mind. Sometimes new students will surprise you because they're fully on board with the core model whereas people who study economics before are still trying to pull the pieces together. And you're definitely going to find that, that some of the quickest are the ones that haven't had any formal training in economics. Uh, learn the labour market model thoroughly. I'll, uh, we've already had a discussion about that, but it's pretty obvious that if you try to uh, teach the way you may have learnt to teach a first year class about the labour market with the supply and demand curve and the market clearing, then you're going to get lost because that's not done in the, in the core approach. There is always unemployment in equilibrium. So don't try and have a clearing labour market in the back of your mind or the students are going to get extremely confused. All of the adjustments are easier if you meet regularly. So this is his piece of advice. Um, the TAs have a weekly meeting, lecturers attend as well uh, to discuss ways to approach the week's teaching. At Warwick University they have a reading group, they were doing that the year ahead of introducing it. And then the TAs also form their own WhatsApp group to have their own kind of offline chats about things they don't understand and how to, how to help each other. So all of this um, is, uh, is, uh, is good advice about how to do things. There's another resource on the website that you might not stumble upon, which are the narrated slides. So these are on the teacher's resources. They've been created by David Klingingsmith, who teaches at a university in the US. And they're a resource, some students might get into it, but probably if they're having problems with insomnia, because it's, it's fairly uh, slowly taught. So a student might well go back to it, when they're trying to learn and really understand the model. But as a first uh, immersion, it's more likely to appeal to a TA or a lecturer really wanting a steady, slow talking through of the model. And David's fantastic. He produces, um, he produces new uh, visualizations, representations using Excel to help you really get the idea. And this is the uh, the, the, the model of how the wage is set by the firm, so this is the best response function, and this is the, uh, the, the ISO cost of effort firm of the firm. So we're looking for this tangency here to find the wage that's going to be set in equilibrium. 
So look for the narrated slides. You find them here, uh, where you can filter all the resources by project, and you just look for the narrated slides, and there's a whole series of them. You can also download the PowerPoint, so if you find some of the slides like this really helpful for your own teaching, then you can put them into your slide pack uh, as well. What are the main take-homes, at least what do we think they are? And uh, it, it's, it's really hard to summarize, and they'll probably be different next year also, because we, you know, we're learning as we go along. Uh, but but we, uh, um, the, the, the pedagogy is hard to describe, and you've been getting various sort of looks at it, but we think it's very important. Uh, and uh, this is uh, establishing the need to know, uh, what's in italics there is a, is a kind of a mantra of core, which is, uh, this was told to us by an expert in pedagogy about six years ago. She said, if you're not doing something, you're not learning anything. And by doing something, what she meant was writing something down, raising your hand, clicking on your phone, something. You've got to be doing something. Uh, and, um, the, uh, and the other, the, the last thing is talk up models, es uh, how essential they are. But, but also remember, they're there to explain something, and the students should be trained also in that. Uh, the, where are they applicable? Well, let, let me give you an example of this. Um, uh, again, this is the, the, the graph I showed you before about uh, the decline in work hours according, as countries got richer. Uh, some, some took their affluence in the form of free time, and some did not. And that was an interesting question. Why? Why did the Americans take their affluence in the form of more consumption, whereas other countries took it more, like the Netherlands, in, the, in, the, in the free time? Uh, so we're going to end up teaching income and substitution effects. And here we have data on the average annual hours of free time for workers. So notice we have a good on this axis, and here we have another good here, which is GDP per capita. And uh, again, interesting bunch of data. You can present it in different ways because the data are available to you. Um, uh, then um, we, of course, have here hours of free time and then something else, the wage or income. Uh, these two things are the same uh, space. Uh, but here we have some data and here we have some uh, uh, conceptual tools. Uh, and um, then finally, for the United States, we try to say, well, look, how did we go from this point here, which is where the U.S. was uh, in, in, in our data set, to that point there? That's a long historical stretch. And then we say, using this model, uh, how do you decompose this change into an income and a substitution effect? Uh, and of course, and then this is the way we teach those, those two effects. And then of course we say, well, uh, how much does that explain? And what does it leave out? It's a crime if you're, the experience of your students in your classroom is they end up feeling stupid instead of feeling brilliant because Making your students feel stupid is disempowering them. It's taking away their voice. Making them feel brilliant is the first step towards them being able to advocate the things they believe in and they need in their society. So we really have to take seriously that the students should come out of our classroom, not every single one, but by the end of the class they should say, damn, I learned a lot. I'm a pretty smart person. I can do stuff. Um, the, the thing we've learned, maybe more than anything else, is this is a difficult curriculum. Um, it's difficult for the teachers, it's difficult for the TAs. I sometimes think it's more difficult for the TAs and for the teachers than it is for the students. Um, uh, notice when Wendy said, uh, quoting Gonzalo, uh, that um, the, the students who have had no economics actually were, were very positive about the course in the first few weeks, while those who had had economics were having difficulties. I've heard many times from instructors that we're having difficulty here because the course is too difficult for the students. And I'm a very polite person, so I've never really said, are you sure it's not that the course is too difficult for the professor? Uh, there are some really new things here, like, for example, the Bruno Angela model or the labor market model. Uh, and those are things that you just have to learn. And if you don't do it, you can't, you know, that's, I mean, they're really pretty essential. Um, and finally, um, I think the, uh, the ability, the, the problem-centeredness of the pedagogy uh, is, is really important. Uh, core, as it stands, does not represent decolonization. Uh, but as I think, you, did you say that it's a platform? Yes. Yeah. It provides this, the architecture, the superstructure, on which you could easily 
do that. I mean, think about Bruno and Angela, and then think about imperialism, uh, apartheid, and so on, in that framework, as, as Reza did in his, in his uh, case. Well, that's, that's what Wendy and I have to say, uh, and we, we now have uh, some time for discussion of these things. Um, I, I just want to say once again, Wendy and I are learning, the core project is, is learning, and we don't think we know the answers to a lot of things. We're passing on what we now think is probably the best we can. It'll be different later.